I'm Sophie Rovner from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from ACS's 250th National Meeting and Exposition in Boston. We're joined today by Dr. Stephen Withers from the University of British Columbia. He's studying how gut bacteria could provide the key to making universal blood. Dr. Withers. Good morning. So you've probably all heard the calls for blood, urgently needed blood, or at least in Canada we have that occasionally on the radio, calls for blood. And there's always calls for O-type blood, and you might have wondered why is it that O-type blood is so important? And that's because O-type blood is universal donor blood. It can be donated to anybody. If you try to donate type A blood to a type B person, very bad things happen. And so that doesn't, you don't want that to be the case. So it's good to have a good supply of O-type blood, but sometimes those supplies run low. So what we have been exploring are ways in which we can uh, convert A blood and o B blood to O-type blood. And the idea is not new. It's been there since the early 80s, but it's just not been practical at the moment. If we could have the first slide, please. So this, these are representations of the structures of the red blood cell. The big red balloon is meant to be the red blood cell. And attached to that are these three funny little shapes uh, at the, in the bottom structure. That represents O-type blood, and these specific uh, cartoon shapes uh, represents very specific sugar structures that are the antigens on the surface of that red blood cell. Now if you compare that with the structures above, which on the right would be the structure of the B antigen that's on B type blood, and on the left would be the A type antigen that's on A type blood, you'll see that they each have an additional little uh, unit. In the case of the B antigen, it's got an additional yellow circle, which is a galactose sugar. And in the case of the A antigen, it's got a little yellow square that's additional to the O. And that's the, a sugar called Galnac. And it's those that give A and B bud their specific character. Now, what we're working on is ways in which we can selectively remove that little yellow circle from B antigen, or that little uh, yellow square from A antigen, and particularly the latter case is the one I can discuss. So to do so, you've got to be able to cut that off under very mild conditions which do not disrupt the red blood cell. And so realistically, I think the only way that can be done is using enzymes, Mother Nature's own catalysts, which are uh, very good at doing things under very mild conditions. So we've been searching for enzymes to do that, and to find such enzymes, we've looked at the human gut because it's known these same sugar structures sit on the gut wall and that bacteria within the gut adhere to the gut wall and they also uh, uh, cleave off many of the sugars on that uh, gut wall and use them as their food source. We're feeding those bacteria, bacteria in a synergistic matter uh, most of the time. And so we argue that quite likely they were also cleaving these sugars, which are present on that uh, gut wall, along with others, and therefore this would be a good source to look in. So that's what we've been doing, and we've fortunately been successful in finding one particular class of enzymes that is 30 times more efficient than any other that had been discovered previously. And so our current status is that we have now this purified enzyme, which we can produce in quantity, and we've shown that we can convert these A red blood cells to O red blood cells according to all the standards used by the Canadian blood services. Uh, obviously, the next stages are all about safety, making sure this doesn't cause any inadvertent effects. And we haven't obviously got to that stage yet. We're now starting to work uh, with the Canadian blood services and with hematologists to go to those next stages. So that's our current situation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. If there are questions, please state your name and affiliation. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Sure. Um, do you expect that it'll be the same enzyme uh, that will be used to convert B to O? And what are the plans to, when do you expect to be able to do that? Yeah, good, good question. Um, in fact, from earlier studies of other people, there are actually are fairly good enzymes already for converting B to O. 
And so uh, we haven't focused too much on that, though we plan to look to see if there are even better ones out there, of course. The enzyme we have discovered does have a small ability to convert B to O. And so we may explore trying to increase that activity uh, so that we could do everything with one. But at the moment, we're happy to just make sure we can get the A cleaved because that's always been the biggest challenge. And also, um, what scale have you operated on so far? And what scale, how do you expect to be able to scale up yeah, the technique? I, I think um, scaling up should not be a problem. Um, what we have done is to um, obviously ultimately isolate, we have isolated the gene for this enzyme uh, from its host source and put it into uh, a host, E. coli in our case. And fortunately it expresses, it produces at very high levels. So we can isolate uh, large quantities even on our lab scale. We've done conversions of whole units of blood in this fashion. Well, one time we have. It's surprisingly hard to get your hands on a unit of blood. There's a lot of paperwork involved. <laughs> but we have shown it's doable. Okay. And also, um, you mentioned 30 times more efficient. And I'm just trying to get my head. What exactly do you mean by 30 times more efficient? No, that's um, a very good question. Um, what, what we did is a side-by-side -side test with the best enzyme that had been used before on the red blood cells. Um, we found that we could, it, it works 30 times faster, its rate constants are 30 times higher. Um, so what that means in practical terms is we need to use 30 times less than you need uh, of the other enzyme. So there's an economic factor. Mm -hmm. And the other factor that's a little less obvious relates to the fact that it's super important that we remove all traces of this added enzyme before that's put into a human because of the dangers of immune responses to bacterial enzymes. So the less enzyme we need to use, the less we have to remove. So there are two good reasons we want to get it to be as efficient as possible. Oops. And, and you said it, it, it speeds the sort of process up as well. So how fast can you do that conversion? And I mean, when do you expect to do that conversion? Would that be something that you would just do as and when needed? Or would you automatically convert to O and have a bigger supply of O? I, su I suspect in the end, I mean, one, one likes to use things untouched when possible. I, I would imagine. I'm not a clinician or a hematologist. But uh, what I'm imagining is uh, one other advantage our enzyme has over the others is it works in whole blood. So you could see this being put into the bag at the time of collection and just sitting there doing its job while this stuff is being stored. Um, so I could imagine you could, uh, it could be, uh, there could be some bags that are treated and some that are left untreated, et cetera, et cetera, because you may want an A antigen after all. So that would be the case. And then we have shown that we can remove the enzyme by simple washing of the red blood cells. Because when a blood transfusion occurs, it's not whole blood that's administered, it's actually the red blood cells. So they spin them down, and that's what's, uh, that's what's actually um, transfused into you in a suitable medium. So it fits very well, from my view, with the current practices used in blood production. Thank you. Laura Cassidy, ACS. Could there be dire consequences if your enzyme is less than 100% efficient at removing antigens? You always want to be able to remove the whole lot of the antigens, which is why you want a really efficient antigen. Uh, what we, sorry, antigen remover. What we have shown so far um, is that according to all the tests used by the Canadian blood services, and I presume they're the same used by most uh, nations, that we completely convert the A to O type. But what we need to do next are, of course, a battery of additional tests, including what's called cross-matching against other people's blood. Um, so we're starting to set up the collaborations that give us access to those sort of uh, samples and ca capacity. But uh, there is always the danger that this is cleaving something that nobody knows about anywhere off of the uh, red blood cell. That clearly has to be shown to not be a problem. Katie Cottingham, ACS. So have you tested the O blood created in this way in animals or in humans yet? No, it will be some time before this can go into humans. It has to go through all the types of uh, safety testing I was just, mess uh, just mentioning. 
We haven't tested it in animals. Animals don't have our same ABO blood system, so we can't test its true capacity in that fashion. Um, but uh, so, so the answer is at this stage, no. We're, we're trying to get as much uh, essentially in vitro studies done as we, can, as we can before we attempt to move there. But there has been clinical trials in the past done with some of the enzymes developed by, by people. So protocols are out there. Bailabus uh, legacius. If you look at the, uh, those structures, uh, of course, there's, uh, there are some commonalities. Uh, take the ex extreme case. If you cleave off that entire uh, uh, side hanging chain from, from uh, the O-type, you, you essentially still have a, a red blood cell. Uh, how functional is it, or is it functional? Yeah, that's a good question. And in fact, um, that was a strategy we looked at earlier, looking at an enzyme that would cut the whole thing off. Um, unfortunately, you have to be really careful on that because you can expose then large amounts of a sugar uh, called galactose or another one called glucnac, which are recognized by receptors on the liver, and then that tends to clear the red blood cells out. So. So we became less adventurous and moved back to just cutting the sim single sugar off to give us uh, the natural antigen. We never tested that that was a problem, but we were alerted to the fact that we might run into those difficulties. Now, stepping back one po uh, point, if you just remove the, uh, the fucose, galactose, or whatever is attached to it, uh, was, was that sometimes entertained uh, as, a, as, a, as a function because, of course, all three uh, cells would, would essentially have the identical configuration. Yeah. Uh, again, it's a, it's a question of avoiding exposure of antigens, uh, not of antigens or of receptor binding capacity that would cause them to be cleared. And so that fucose protects the cell or, or masks that terminal galactose that's on there, which would otherwise be recognized by this clearance receptor. The, the galactose that we're cutting off is alpha configured, which is not bound to that receptor, but the galactose that you would expose is beta configured, um, which is, means its linkage is different. And so that is the one that would be recognized and cleared. Now, stepping one th away from the ABO system, mm -hmm. RH factor was always always a, a problem, particularly for, for pregnant women and all, the, all exactly. that. Exactly. A lot of typing I've done uh, uh, there. Um, is there a potential for uh, for something like these, uh, these enzymes to essentially make an RH positive into an RH negative or, 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 or attaching something to uh, there? Uh, I, I'm not even sure where the heck the RH factor is, whether it's a, attached to a cell or mm -hmm. whether it's just a plasma right. material. So uh, certainly these things are possible, but the RH factor or the RH antigen is actually a protein which is embedded in the membrane. So it's a lot harder to see removing that in any way uh, you know, after production of the red blood cells. There are people trying to mask it by putting polymer coats and things like that on the surface, so that might be the way to uh, to tackle the RH factor. Yes, I, I, I have seen people trying to titrate it out, but, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, that's still kind of a it, thought. It's tricky, and in fact, partly the reason we got into this is that some of our colleagues were interested in that as that strategy as a way to mask the AB antigens, but the AB antigens project much further from the cell surface on these sugar stalks. And that was just not a feasible strategy. They would require so much of a load of polymer. Whereas that's a good thing if enzymes want to access there, they can easily access these uh, sugars out on these stalks. So maybe some combination will be the, the, the right way in the end. So I was just interested in uh, the novelty of that metagenomics approach to actually finding these novel glyc glycosidases. Mm -hmm. And I know um, you talk about sort of finding some 
unusual ones from humans and from beaver feces. And right. I wonder if you could say a little bit about, about sure. that and what potential applications they Maybe. might have. What, what glycosidases are we particularly interested in finding, for example? Sure, if we can go to the next slide. So I just have a little um, graphic showing, indicating the metagenomics approach. And so conceptually, you, you, you take... Um, bacteria or microorganisms from an environment that's likely you think is likely to contain the enzyme of interest. And then rather than trying to culture all these individual organisms, which um, has not so far proved feasible uh, because many of them cannot be cultured individually, what you do is treat them globally and isolate their DNA intact from there or mass from there. And then clone out the whole set of genes from that into a, a host such as E. coli and look for the activity you want. So again, this approach was clearly developed by others uh, years back. We're just applying that approach. Um, where we started using this was uh, in the area of biofuels because that was very fundable like seven or eight years ago. And so we looked at a, a number, of, uh, and others did too, at a number of forest soil uh, sources, that being a logical place to find cellulose-degrading enzymes. But then we had the, the bright idea one day that our Canadian national animal, the beaver, was, uh, was really a, a, a master at eating cellulose, and so maybe the beaver gut would contain interesting enzymes that degrade cellulose and hemicellulose. And so we have performed such an analysis, and it just appeared in ISME Journal just this last month, in fact, the work from there. Uh, what was a little disappointing was, I mean, at heart, I'm a, I'm a mechanistic enzymologist. I'm interested in looking for new mechanisms. And we didn't find all that much that was truly novel in that study. Uh, I think largely because there has been so much work done on biofuel-converting enzymes, and so most of them probably have been discovered. But now when we go into more unusual activities, and we have several other things we're looking at, we're starting to pull up much more novelty from the, uh, from the environment. So I personally think this is a very powerful tool. Um, people estimate, and by the way, microbiologists argue about this number all the time, but, but the estimate that, that maybe only 5% of the microorganisms out there have ever been truly investigated and, and grown up individually, so that means that the other 95% are there for the taking. There must be huge uh, genomic capacity within that, huge reservoirs of enzymes, some of which will be completely new and interesting and hopefully useful. Thank you. What determines the type of blood that an individual produces? Their parents. <laughs> Genetics rules, yeah. Yeah, so it's very much uh, determined by that entirely. All right, any further questions? All right, well, thank you very much. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore Boston 2018. Please join us for our next press conference at 10.30 a.m. today on nanobot pumps that destroy nerve agents. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>